the next geometric property we'll look at is uh, area of a triangle. And a triangle formed again by two vectors. So we're gonna start up the same picture. Vector one, vector two. So how do you make a triangle from two vectors? Well, you just basically seal off that third side right there. So there's our triangle. And I want to know what's the area right here. And the way we're going to figure it out is if we would have made a parallelogram, it would look like that. And we know how to get the area right above there. So the area of a parallelogram is twice the area of a triangle. And how can you see the uh, these two areas are the same? Think about this center point right here. And if you rotate that blue triangle 180 degrees around that point, it will sit right on top of the original black and green triangle. So basically we're gonna take half of the area of a parallelogram. So area of a triangle is V1 cross V2, cut that in half. It says area of a triangle. And that does, uh, does it for the areas. Uh, there is one more geometric property that has to do with the angle between two vectors. It's gonna seem very similar to what we looked at with the dot product. So angle between two vectors. And this uses not cosine, but sine. And it's really similar to the dot product, except in the numerator, it's V1 cross V2, and you have to take the magnitude of that vector. Now, if you're gonna compute the angle between two vectors, it's way faster to use the dot product and the cosine. So let's write the uh, recall. Uh, it's better to use, if you just want angle, cos theta is v1 dot v2 divided by magnitude v1 magnitude v2. So there is a sign of formula, but I strongly recommend if I ask for an angle, go with the cosine. It's way faster to compute a dot product than it is to compute a cross product. Lots of chance for mistakes on cross products. So let's look at the uh, algebraic properties of a cross product. So what happens if you cross a vector with itself? So if we think about the, uh, the right hand rule, so here's one finger, here's the other finger. Nope, I better draw them the same length. So you got both vectors right on top of each other. So geometrically, there's a problem. Well, one vector would be perpendicular to both vectors. Well, of course, if you got one point straight up, it would be perpendicular. But remember, think in three dimensions now. So not just straight up, but um, if you have your, your hand with your first two fingers pointing the exact same direction, uh, there you could actually, your thumb could uh, point not just up and not just down, but could point directly out of the page or you know, out of the plane or actually anywhere if you rotated this uh, 360 degrees, any vector in this plane would be perpendicular to the two vectors that are on top of each other. And if you take two vectors and uh, the same vector and cross it with itself, what you're gonna get is the zero vector. I'm gonna explicitly write zero, zero, zero because <clears throat> we know it's gonna be a three dimensional vector and it will be the zero vector. So a vector cross with itself is the zero vector. We already saw the anti-commutative property. I'll just rewrite that here, negative V cross U. So that's anti-commutative property. The reason, one of the reasons we call it a product uh, is, well, really the only reason we call it a product is the fact that it distributes. So we'll look at that. 
it distributes across addition. Uh, not only does this distribute this way, but also if you cross on the right side, it distributes this way. So the first, first way we distributed basically to the right, and the second one we're gonna distribute to the left. And you get u cross w plus v cross w. It's really important you pay attention to the order. If w is originally on the right side, when you multiply, when you do a cross product, it better be still on the right side. So this cross product is not a commutative product. So you want to be a little careful uh, when you take cross products that you don't swap the order. Uh, last up is scalar multiplication with cross products. You can move the scalar around. So you can multiply, you can compute the cross product and then multiply by a scalar, or you could multiply by one of the two vectors by the scalar first, or you can multiply the other vector by the scalar first, and it's all going to give you the same value. Uh, one word of warning, uh, right over here in red. You don't get to distribute like this, uh, because if you think about what's happening here, well, we're getting an alpha and an alpha out, so this would actually be alpha squared u cross v. So the way to think about this, if you just had numbers, let's say uh, two times three times four, this is not two times three times two times four. So you don't get to distribute multiplication across multiplication. This does not, uh, this is not a property of multiplication. So you wanna be careful. They're called products for a reason. In a lot of ways, they act like regular products. So don't distribute across multiplication. That is not okay to do. All right, so these are our properties. And I'm going to go on and do, um, ah, let's see, there's one more. Uh, it's actually going to be a theorem. If u is not the zero vector and the v is not the zero vector, and if u cross v equals zero, so if you take the cross product and you get zero, what that means is u and v are parallel or anti-parallel. And a real fast way if you want to see this proved. Uh, proof. So, well, this won't be a full proof. I better not write that there. But if uh, u and v are parallel or anti parallel, that means one is a scalar multiple of each other. So u equals alpha v. Um, and alpha is not zero. If alpha is positive, they're parallel. If alpha is negative, they're anti-parallel. And what would happen if I did u cross uh, v? Well, I'm going to sub substitute out u for alpha v. Then I'm going to use that property right there at the top of the screen. I'm going to move alpha outside. And if we cross the vector with itself, we're going to get the zero vector and alpha times the zero vector is the zero vector. So if two uh, vectors are scalar multiples of each other, meaning they're parallel or anti-parallel, then uh, the cross product will equal zero.
this is not the fastest way to determine parallel or anti-parallel. The fastest way is to just look, are these vectors multiples of each other? So we'll do an example here. So we'll go with uh, 1, 3, negative 2, and we'll do 6, negative 18, 12. All right, so are they parallel, anti-parallel, or neither? So we're trying to see if one is a scalar multiple of the other. So just looking here, look at the x-coordinates. So maybe, uh, maybe u is six times bigger than V. So find a real number alpha such that alpha U equals V, um, or you could just as easily move alpha to the other side as the reciprocal. So it doesn't matter which side alpha is gonna be on. I wanna multiply alpha times V so we'll put alpha on the v side. So it looks like alpha should equal six. So I'm choosing six because that makes the first coordinate work out, the x coordinate work out. So we'll try six times one, three, negative two. And that's 6, 18, negative 12, which unfortunately is not 6, negative 18, positive 12. So 6 would have worked on the first coordinate, but it messes up the second two coordinates. There's a sign issue. So these are not parallel or anti-parallel. So we're going to go with neither. So no, there's no such alpha. So the answer is neither. You can do this with the cross product, but it just takes a little more time. So next we're gonna find both unit vectors orthogonal. the vector u which is 3 2 negative 1 and w which is 2 i minus j plus 3 k so when i say both unit vectors so first of all uh, we have to find unit vectors but really the important First thing to pay attention to, we need to get an orthogonal vector. So how do we take two vectors and get or, an orthogonal vector? We're gonna do a cross product. So the cross products are already orthogonal to U and W, so we're gonna get through that first. And again, i, j, k, 3, negative 2, negative 1, and w is 2, negative 1, 3. So I'm taking the matrix right there. Uh, I probably should circle that first row. So we got negative 2, negative 1, negative 1, 3. Minus j times 3, negative 1, 2, 3, plus k, 3, negative 2, 2, negative 1. Negative 6, negative 1 times negative 1. So this one's a little tricky, so I'm going to write out the full 
a version with all the negative signs. So remember, we go up this diagonal, it's going to already get another minus sign. So we get negative 1 times negative 1, but we're subtracting that. Minus j. Uh, 3 times 3 is 9. So we get minus negative uh, 2 times negative 1. I'm being a little careful because we have multiple negative signs here. So we get minus 3 minus 2 times negative 2. So we get negative 6. Three negatives make a negative. So two negatives make a positive. So minus 3 plus 4. So negative 7i minus 11j plus 1k. All right, so we have an orthogonal vector. Now it's definitely not a unit vector. This vector is way, way, way too big to be a unit vector. As soon as you see any coordinate go past 1, there's no way you have a unit vector. All right, so we do have a vector that's perpendicular, but it's going to be too big. So let's go ahead and scale this down. Uh, let's give this another name. Well, let's call this uh, v right here. So we need to scale v to be a unit vector. The way we do that, we're going to take v divided by the magnitude of v. Or you could write it as the reciprocal of the magnitude times v. So let's get the magnitude of v right now. It's going to be square root. Now I don't care about those negative signs. Because when I square, they're going to disappear. So I got 49. 11 squared is 121. 1 squared is 1. Now I really suck at addition, but 49 plus 1 is 50. So that's square root of 171. All right, so this is one unit vector perpendicular. Remember, it goes the same direction. All we did was we figured out that this Magnitude is way too big, so we scaled it down, and now we have a small vector, a unit vector, that's perpendicular. How do we get the other unit vector? Well, I could take a cross product where I swap the order, or I could just think, well, here's the other unit vector, and it's going to be negative of what I just got. So the other unit vector is exactly the same, except it's going to change signs. So our other unit vector will be the same number in the front, except it's positive 7, positive 11, negative 1. You can distribute the scalar inside, but I don't really want to do that. I think this is totally OK. I'll leave an answer like this. So I see the you know, scaling factor out front, and then I see your vector uh, red in there. So we have one more problem to do. We're going to actually go ahead and compute an area. Of a para parallelogram. with vertices so we're not given vectors we're given points and we're supposed to get vectors from this now how is this parallelogram laid out we got four points
trying to draw a good parallelogram here. All right, so here's our par parallelogram. So how do I know that it's going to look like this? I actually have absolutely no clue how this is going to look. Uh, for all I know, uh, maybe this is P3 at the top and P4 is down there. Oh, sorry, P3, P2. So maybe it's laid out like this. Uh, <clears throat> what you, the only way to really uh, do this correctly and, and still come out with the wrong answer, or do a process that's almost correct and still come out with the wrong answer, is if I happen to compute this vector and this vector, and then I cross them. So if I had those two vectors and cross them, what would I get? Well, looking at those, they're, they're parallel. They're the same vectors. So if I cross those two vectors, I would get the zero vector. So the way to know that uh, you chose, the two vectors you chose were not the proper vectors is if you come out with the area of zero. So your area should not be zero on a parallelogram. If it is zero, you most likely made these two vectors. So I don't want these two vectors. What I want are two vectors that originate from the same vertex or originate from the same point. So I'm going to give these names u and v. So end, so for the vector u, the end is p3, start is p1, and for the vector v, the end is p4, the start is p1. So we have to do some subtractions here. So we got p3, negative 1, 3, negative 1, minus, I chose 0, 0, 0 on purpose as one of the vertices, so we're not the spend any mental energies actually subtracting. P4 is 210 0 minus 0, 0, 0. So these are very easy subtractions because you're subtracting 0. All right, so those are our two vectors, u and v. Now, a minute ago, you saw me swap P3 and P2. So let's say that uh, somebody else comes along and maybe they have the same vector v, but maybe they use this vector, I'll call this vector w in blue. Well, what is w? w will be p2 minus p1. Now, if I use, let's say I use the u and w, and I made a parallelogram from u and w, what would that parallelogram look like? Well, it wouldn't really use this side at all. That side would be out, so ignore that side. But the parallelogram would look like this right here. Now, it turns out that parallelogram has the same area as our original parallelogram. And how do you see that? Just think about this area will be exactly the same as that area. It's a different parallelogram, but if you cut it up like this, it's actually exactly the same area. So you can compute the area of the parallel of this other parallelogram and you will get the exact same value as if you computed the area of the original parallelogram. And again this vector w would be let's see p2 minus p1 that would be the vector 3 negative 2 1. And u cross w the area would be the same as u cross v which would be the same as area if I went and used W and V, I'd get the same exact area as well. It also turns out that if you swap the order, that does not mess up the area either because what you're gonna do after you get the cross product is you're gonna compute the magnitude. And that magnitude doesn't care if the vector is pointing one direction or the opposite direction. It just looks at the length of the vector and it will be the same length. So all these will give you the exact same uh, number for the area. So let's just compute right off of u and v that we're using right here. So again, ijk, and make sure the values are on the screen. There we go. 
minus one, three minus one. In general, it matters if you compute the right order, uh, the right order of the cross product, but because at the end I'm gonna take a magnitude, uh, this doesn't actually matter. Now I am computing a determinant and then the magnitude. So I really should have two sets of vertical bars. The inner set is uh, for the determinant and the outer set is for the magnitude of the resulting vector we're going to get. And actually because of that, let's go ahead and use some fancy colors. I'll go with green for our magnitude at the very end. So we'll just keep swapping in some green here. So we have our i, j, k, so cover that row up. So we have i times three, negative one, one, zero, minus j times negative one, negative one, two, zero, plus k times minus one, three, two, one. All right, so we get Oops, better go back. So we get zero. Now we get negative one times one, which is negative one, but we're subtracting. So it's actually plus one minus j zero plus two. We had the double negative there. Minus one minus six. This is I minus two, oh no. Not easy to keep track of these colors. So we got I minus two J minus seven K. And again, we still have, the last thing we have to do, we still have to take a magnitude of all this. <clears throat> so now we'll just do the rest in the black marker. This is just a magnitude here. So it's square root one squared plus two squared, I'm getting rid of the negative signs because I know I'm squaring, they're gonna disappear. So that's one plus four plus 49, which is 54. I think that factors into nine times something, nine times six, and nine is three squared. So we could write as three squared root six. I'm completely okay with not, uh, not simplifying that square root 54. So either one of those is correct.